This is uh, a friend of mine, Bill Kinkle. I showed this in one of the earlier sets, but I just think it's great to have this uh, frequency of exposure to endoscopy. So this is Bill doing nasal endoscopy on himself, and as I mentioned, this is how I learned on me. Uh, or this is how I you know, acquired the skill set, by practicing on myself. So we're passing the uh, inferior turbinate. We're in the right side, the septum's here. And now we exit the nasal pharynx. Your station tube was there, posterior pharynx, soft palate. And this is what I was saying about getting past the soft tissue ring. So you breathe through the nose, it opens up space, then you articulate the lever down. So articulate strong down, and now you get this view. And now, if you haven't breathed through the nose and you start having him phonate, you can see the cords come together with phonation. E, E, E. There's Bill's esophagus. I am unable to distend my esophagus without vomiting, but Bill can do that. But remember, we are apex down in this view, so anterior is down. And here comes a burp. Bill's going to burp for us. But the esophagus is a potential space back here, so right here. Wait for it. There it is. Bill had reflux in the past, and on this image, actually, you can see his larynx looks good. He doesn't have any evidence of erythema irritation that we would see with reflux. With phonation, the cords are coming together, and we're seeing that very well here. Yeah, and you're in my frame now. Greetings, airway fans, live from Auckland, New Zealand. Yeah, I like these videos. All right. So here's laryngeal landmarks. This time I rolled the images up, so we went in the orientation we would see if the patient is supine. So anterior is up and posterior is down. This is what we see uh, when we're doing laryngoscopy in a patient in a supine position, but it is the opposite of the ENT worldview, which I showed you on the prior image. So whenever we pick up endoscopes because there is badness about the mouth, you should be prepared you should be prepared to cut the neck. So I consider this device as hand in hand with having the scalpel, um, my small tracheal tube, or a uh, you know small um, uh, tracheostomy tube. Uh, what I need for a surgical airway, I consider this should go hand in hand with that surgical stuff. I want to have ketamine at the ready in case I have to sort of administer that to the patient and cut the neck. Uh, I don't want them hitting me. Um, I also, um, you know, announce to the nurses, hey, we're doing a nasoendoscopy for a difficult airway. If we don't succeed, we may be converting this to a surgical uh, airway. So, um, I would presume that if there's real badness about the mouth, you may not be able to rescue them with supraglottic airways, high flow, or other things. Not that I wouldn't try it, but I just wouldn't act as though that is a guaranteed out. You may need to cut the neck if there is badness about the tongue and the mouth, and you start and either, let's say, Bleeding occurs, the patient all of a sudden aspirates. Um, you know, you have to be ready to go with the surgical airway if you're picking up an endoscope for these truly difficult cases with high grade oral pathology.